one. It is now 9.33 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of August 14th, 2018 is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda and order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Cassandra? I would ask that we remove item P from the consent agenda and add it to discussion and approval somewhere else in the agenda. Support. I guess it would just go to item to 14, discussion action item. Yes. Okay. Have a motion, second. So, uh, we vote on that uh, amendment first, okay. and then we'll vote on the yes. approval of the agenda. Okay. Yeah. All in favor? Well, will you repeat the amendment, please? Uh, the amendment is to remove item P from the consent agenda and move it to uh, 14 for, so that we can discuss and um, vote on it separately outside of the consent agenda. And Richard seconded that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Okay. Support. Second. We have a motion by Tom to approve the agenda as amended, a second by Lupe. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Public comment on social study standards has been extended. There are additional listen and learn sessions that are scheduled around the state as well as an online survey that's available. The public input window will close on September 30th, at which time the feedback will be reviewed and considered by the panel of experts. Based on the volume of the feedback that we have received so far and anticipate continuing to receive, it will take us some time for an updated draft to be ready for the state boards to consider. In keeping in our past practice, we will provide the board with all of the public comments. Moving on to the introduction of State Board of Education members and guests. Marilyn, would you please introduce the members of the State Board of Education? I will. Thank you. I'll start on my left. Sheila Alice is the interim state superintendent and chairperson of the board. To her left is Richard Ziley. He's a co-president of the board, and he resides in Dearborn. <laughs> Cassandra Albrich, the other co-president, resides in Rochester Hills. Michelle Fecto, board secretary. She lives in Detroit. Nikki Snyder lives in Dexter. She's a member of the State Board of Education. The current Teacher of the Year, Luke Wilcox, who's been with us for a year, is seated at that end of the table. And as we go across the table, Tyler Sawyer represents the Governor's Office, Strategic Advisor for Education and Career Connections. Eileen Weiser, board member from Ann Arbor. Lupe Ramos Montini, She's a board member from Grand Rapids. She serves as the board's NASB delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education. Pamela Pugh, she lives in Saginaw. And next to me is Tom McMillan, the board's treasurer, and he resides in Oakland Township. I'm Marilyn Schneider, I'm the state board executive. Thank you, Marilyn. You're welcome. And I will begin today with introducing our new employees. And I will start um, by introducing Scott Kenischek. He is our new deputy superintendent for the division of P20 Systems and Student Transitions. We're pleased to have Scott join our leadership team. And Scott, if you'd like to share a little bit about your background with everyone today. So as Sheila said, my name is Scott Kenishnick, um, and I'm very grateful and pleased to join the MBE team. It's been a great couple of weeks. I started on August 1st. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I am a Chippewa through and through. I have a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate uh, at Central Michigan University. Uh, when I graduated officially with a bachelor's, I began teaching on the southwest side of Grand Rapids in Granville. 
um, right before it really exploded. It was in the mid-90s before the mall was built and such. And so I taught for three years, uh, became an assistant principal for four uh, in Portland, uh, and then became a high school principal uh, and eventually a superintendent. So served as a local superintendent for six years uh, at Fowler, went to Montcalm ISD, which is a small rural ISD north and west of here, served in Montcalm for eight years, and then um, just finished up actually in Ingham ISD, where I was the Ingham ISD superintendent for the past three years. Um, and so 17 years as a school superintendent, 11 of those at the ISD. Um, so professionally speaking, that's a little bit of my background. Personally speaking, um, my wife and I, Jenny, have been married 24 years. We have five kids, um, so an active home life as well. We have Madison Ann, who's 20, Mackenzie Faith uh, is 18, Josie is uh, 16, uh, my son Cooper uh, is 13. Cooper has autism, um, which is uh, a whole way of life um, and parenting. Um, and so it took us a while to get our feet back underneath us after Coop was born and the autism hit, um, but he's doing well now. And we brought little Annie on board about six years ago. And so we go from 20 down to six uh, at our place. And so, um, again, pleased to be here. I've been fortunate for the past four or five years to be engaged in a lot of activity with the department from the field perspective. Um, and so worked with State Superintendent uh, Whiston and Norma Jean Sass on some of the early top 10 and 10 work, um, have been fortunate to be involved in the development of the ESSIP, uh, the State Systemic Improvement Plan. So um, was able to bring a lot of that prior knowledge into uh, this role here. So. Thank you, Scott. And it's a pleasure to have you on board with us. Thank you. And Vanessa, would you please continue introducing new employees? Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Ann Green, who's just joined us in the Office of Educator and Coach. And Kyle. Good morning. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce Stacy Lamper McFall with our Office of Health and Nutrition Services. Hi, I'm Stacy Lamper McFall, and uh, yes, I work for the Office of Services as a financial analyst. I come from Network 180, which is some of the uh, Before that, I was in banking and kids and somehow in <laughs> and I'm really happy. Elizabeth Reed with the Library of Michigan and other centers. Kiana Barton, also with the Library of Michigan. Kiana Barton, also with the Library of Michigan as a student digitization. Um, I'm Still in school, I'll be getting my bachelor's in business and nutrition management. Okay, and then Scott. Around to see if I can find Tracy. To introduce Tracy uh, Kurtwright, I guess I'll speak about her a little bit anyway. She has joined our Office of Special Education as a consultant, uh, comes to us with a wealth of experience actually from the state of Oklahoma, uh, where she worked at the Oklahoma State Department of Ed, uh, and most recently served as a disabilities coordinator for the University of uh, Michigan in Portland. So. Thank you. Did we miss any new employees in the room? Okay, so thank you and welcome to all of our new employees. It is truly a pleasure to have you join the MDE team. And now we would like the audience members to please introduce themselves, starting with Marty. Oh, hi. Good morning. I'm uh, Martin Ackley. I'm the Director of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. Good morning. I'm Caroline Lucas. I'm the Legislative Liaison for the Good morning. I'm Lois Lofton Donover from the American Public. Good morning, I'm Chelsea Martinez with the Secondary School Principals Association. David Michelson with the Michigan Education. I am Alicia Fly, Assistant Superintendent for the Child Intermediate School District. Good morning, Paul Sawa, Wayne Reese. Good 
supporting Piper Bogner, Superintendent Kent. Elker from Collierville School. Wayne Rodell, Collierville Community School. Good morning, Mark Pascarella, Lansing School District. <clears throat> I Kevin O'Neill, Superintendent, Vicksburg Community School. Going along to the side. Yes. Uh, Dan Vandermeulen, middle school principal, Lowell area. Uh, Spencer Cook, Stuart House. Final. Bill Fennessy, and I back the executive committee, and I represent the Michigan Association of Boards on CR. Wonderful. Welcome to everyone who is in the room. Thank you for joining our State Board of Education meeting this morning. If you plan to offer public comment at today's, oh, I forgot, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, I forgot Mark and Wendy. My apologies. Mark Howell, uh, Chief of Staff, Chief Deputy Superintendent. And Scott. Scott. Benefit 20 Systems and Student Charges. Kyle. Good morning, Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations. Okay, once again, welcome to everyone in the room for attending today's State Board of Education meeting. And if you plan to offer public comment at today's meeting, please complete a form and get that form to Maryland. Forms are available on the table outside of the boardroom, and they must be submitted prior to the beginning of the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break scheduled for approximately 1 p.m. We ask that you please be here on time to make sure that you have an opportunity to address the State Board. Former State Superintendent Brian Whiston has left a lasting impression on many of us, including all of us sitting around the table. Um, during the past two weeks, he has been honored in a couple of ways. Um, last week, Governor Snyder recognized Brian for his outstanding leadership and his passionate commitment to the students of Michigan by dedicating the fountain outside the John A. Hanna building in his honor. And it was a wonderful tribute to an exemplary leader. And we have a photo of the dedication. Beautiful plaque, constant reminder to us as we pass by the fountain of Brian's leadership. Also, Brian has been named Policy Leader of the Year by the National Association of State Boards of Education. The annual award is given to national and state policymakers in recognition to their contributions in education. The award will be presented at the NASB Annual Conference in October, and that's just a few months, a couple months away. Mm -hmm. As Brian's colleagues and his friends, we certainly appreciate his 
contributions and the recognition that he is receiving for those contributions. Moving on to the consent agenda, item three. We have two resolutions that require approval before we move to the presentations. Um, one is honoring the 2017-18 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Luke Wilcox, and the other is honoring the 2018-19 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Laura Chang. May I please have a motion to approve the resolutions? So moved. Okay. So moved. So moved. Support. <laughs> and support? Support. Support by Pam. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Presentation of Michigan Teacher of the Year. Item four on our agenda. Luke Wilcox, the 2017-18 Michigan Teacher of the Year. He is a math teacher at East Kentwood High School in Kentwood Public Schools. This is Luke's final board meeting. We will miss him. He has been a valuable resource to the board table, as well as during his countless visits in the field. He has been a passionate advocate for teachers and students. We thank Luke for his contributions to the teaching profession and for enriching the students in all of our lives. Luke, this is your final Michigan Teacher of the Year report. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, so, you know, of course, this being the, the last meeting, I've, I've done a lot of reflection over the last uh, couple of weeks. And I remember back, it was just about a year ago when I, you know, I first came to this table. And uh, I, I remember being very intimidated, not having any idea what this was going to be about and, and really what my role was going to be. And so, of course, I looked on the agenda, and the agenda said that the Michigan Teacher of the Year uh, had to give a report. And so initially, I thought that that would be a report of all of the things that I had done. So in the month, I would go through and I would say, well, here's what I did here, and I went to this school, and I visited this conference, and that is my report of my yeah. Michigan Teacher of the Year. And as I thought about it more, um, that's not what I wanted to do here, because I don't think that, I mean, well, I think that's wonderful, and we want to honor the teaching profession, and I think we've done that. Uh, I thought it was more important that we're discussing uh, educational issues. Uh, at these meetings. And so I decided that report meant that I was going to give a report about some, some idea or some challenge that we're facing in education. So rather than like a rundown of the things that I had done that month, uh, I usually just brought something that I had been thinking about that particular month. And so I just want to uh, highlight a couple of things. Number one, uh, what I tried to do when I, when I presented a challenge or, or a, an idea in education, I always try to pair that with a possible solution. Because I've been in enough teachers' lounges where I've heard teachers complaining about how things are and, and how they should be, but without, without the second part of the conversation being what is the, what is the possible solution for this. So I really tried to stay solution-focused when I, when I came to these meetings and I presented ideas. And uh, you know, each month I brought a different idea, and I just want to highlight a couple of those. Okay? So in February, uh, I brought to the board some, some thinking around the idea of the teacher shortage that we're going to face nationally, but also within the state of Michigan, and more specifically, looking at our teacher workforce and the lack of diversity that we have present in our teacher workforce. And I uh, proposed a possible solution in a program that's called Educators Rising, which is a CTE program that they are now implementing in high schools to try and get high school students excited about becoming teachers, with a specific intentionality of, of going after minority students uh, to encourage more minorities into the teaching profession. Uh, in April, I brought in some data. I am a statistics teacher, and I started a lot of our conversations with data that looked at the differences between schools in rich communities and schools in poor communities, and specifically some of the resources that are provided between those two schools, and then also the academic performance differences between those two schools. And uh, uh, also proposed some possible solutions uh, as related to funding structures and the way that we provide funding for schools and thinking about how it costs uh, more money to educate certain students and how we need to think about that as we move forward in our funding structures. Uh, and then, of course, one of the common themes that you heard from me definitely this year was about teacher leadership 
and the power of teacher leadership within, within all schools, not, not just low-income schools, but the power that teacher leadership can provide for moving schools forward. And then in May, uh, just after my week in Washington, D.C., uh, I provided a, a little bit of the details in, uh, a, in a discussion that the Teachers of the Year had with uh, Secretary of Education uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, specifically around the idea of school choice, and uh, uh, brought to the table that many of the teachers at the, in Washington, D.C. Uh, had concerns about the way that school choice had played out in their particular states, uh, and, and I also voiced my, my similar concern. And so uh, my, my recommended solution there was about thinking about uh, accountability for charter schools and, and being sure that there is some accountability measures for charter schools. Uh, and ultimately, if we can, uh, providing more funding for, for the public schools. And so uh, I brought several other ideas. Those were just a couple that I wanted to highlight. And uh, I think it's important that uh, as we move forward that we continue to be solution focused that we're not just talking about things that are, are, are wrong or things that we'd like to be differently, but like how do we actually do that? And I cannot tell you how thankful I am for this, this year that I've had as Michigan Teacher of the Year. I have learned as much as I learned in my first year of teaching. And if you know anything about the first year of teaching, it is a crazy learning year. You learn by fire. And I, I am 39 years old, and I feel like I have grown as much this year as in my first year of teaching when I was 21. And I am so, so grateful for all of you at this table, for everyone at the MDE. I am so grateful to Kentwood Public Schools for being supportive of me in this role. And I really just hope that I can take these experiences that I've had this year and bring those back into my classroom, bring those back into my school district, and continue to, to advocate for, for teachers and for students around uh, the state and around the country. So uh, th thank you, thank you so much. And I urge you to continue to include teacher voice when it comes to making decisions about anything that is education related. And I've, I've, I've greatly appreciated that experience this year. So thank you. Thank you. note it truly has been a pleasure to get to know you this past year and also to um, hear your reports every month I have found them to be enlightening and insightful and solution oriented so thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and bringing some food to thought um, to the board table for us to consider thank you thank you can okay. I say something okay yes um, uh, you have me crying <laughs> Uh, it, it has been a ride. It has been a journey. It has been an experience to have you here sitting with us making uh, comments about the decisions that we have to make. You have grown so much from when, at this time last year to now, and I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, and I'm, I'm so proud that you are a teacher and that you will continue and not and taking what you learn to bring all the profession up. So all educators here in the room, watch this young man because he is has a lot to offer anybody. And he's from our side of the state, Lowell and you know. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything that you did. You are you should be very proud. Very proud. Thank you, Lupe. Uh, very briefly, um, so I really appreciate your comments, and I've appreciated them all year long because I I agree with you. It's it's not enough just to raise what the problems are. You have to offer potential solutions as well, and it might not always be the best solution or the right solution, but at least you're thinking about uh, how do we fix something that we all notice might be um, not working well. And so the August board meeting for me is always one of the best board meetings because. We really are celebrating great teaching, and we get to celebrate all of the teachers that are here with us today. But it's also really bittersweet, because we have to say goodbye to the Teacher of the Year, who we've gotten to know over the last year. And so we will definitely miss you at this board table. You've, been, uh, you've offered some great insight for us. 
And uh, I hope that you continue to do that and continue to advocate because you're uh, definitely a powerful voice and we really appreciate it. Thank you. And now Cassandra and Richard um, will make a presentation to Lou. Staff will give it to you. Oh, staff will give you the. That way, everyone can see. So, on behalf of the State Board of Education, um, it's our honor to present you with this resolution. Uh, that um, recognizes your years of service to the teaching profession and um, everything that you've done to support students in the state of Michigan. And uh, it, I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but it says, uh, resolve that the State Board of Education expresses its deepest appreciation and gratitude to Luke Wilcox and the thousands of educators in the great state of Michigan for their outstanding work and be it finally resolved that the State Board of Education supports all efforts, training, and resources available to our state's educators so that they may continue to educate and positively influence the children of today as they become the leaders of tomorrow. So there's for you, and thank you very much for your service. We really appreciate it. On May 18th at Sunset Elementary School in Vicksburg, I made a surprise announcement naming Laura Chang as the 2018-19 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Lupe and Michelle were members of the selection committee and Michelle joined me at Sunset Elementary School. Laura is a second grade teacher and is described by her colleagues as living and breathing education. She has 18 years of classroom experience and was selected from hundreds of nominees statewide. Deputy Superintendent Vanessa Kiesler and Jennifer Robel, the manager of the District Outreach Unit in the Office of Educator Excellence, are here to facilitate this presentation today. Good morning. This is my first time at the board table, so I'm trying not to show my sheer utter panic right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for having us, and thank you for taking the time out to do this. It's really, it means a lot to not only the educators in the room, but us in our office specifically. Um, the Michigan Teacher of the Year program, organized by the Michigan Department of Education, Office of Educator Excellence, and sponsored by MEMIC, identifies exceptional teachers in our state, recognizes their effective work in the classroom, amplifies their voices and empowers them to participate in policy discussions at the state level. Teachers are recognized both regionally and at, state, and, a, and at a statewide level. Regional Teachers of the Year, the R Toys as we call them, and the Michigan Teacher of the Year comprise the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council and serve as an invaluable resource to the Michigan Department of Education and other educational stakeholders. In addition to serving as the head of the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council, the MTOI represents Michigan teachers at national events organized by the Council of Chief, Chief State School Officers and the Michigan Teacher of the Year is the Michigan candidate for National Teacher of the Year. These are toys and MTOI were selected on a multi-level process that began with more than 500 different teachers this year. And they were nominated by staff, students, parents, fellow educators, and community members. That is more than 20 times the number of nominations during the 17-18 school year. So that is how much process, um, <coughs> progress that our office has been making with recognition. So now, let's watch the moment when Laura is announced as the new MTOI.
2018-2019 Teacher of the Year. Are you ready? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Laura Chan. Oh dear, my my very proud son plays that on a loop. <laughs> and, and every time I watch it, I get a little teary. It was just a, it was an amazing day, a really special day. And I was so glad to have so many important people there to help celebrate that. Well, I'm, um, I'd like to take some time to tell you a little bit about myself, introduce myself, and give you some background on um, some of the, the big issues I hope to be a voice for this year as Michigan Teacher of the Year. I... Um, I'm a proud product of Western Michigan University. I graduated in 99 with a Bachelor of Science in Education, and then again a few years later with a Master of Arts degree. Shortly after graduating with my master's, Western asked if I would stay on board as a part-time faculty member. So I teach an evening class each semester in the College of Education, Special Education and Literacy Studies Department, um, undergrad and graduate courses in um, reading instruction and incorporating literacy strategies into content area instruction for high school teachers. My 18 years um, of teaching experience is all in Vicksburg Community Schools in the southwest corner of Michigan there. We're a district of about 160 teachers, a little over 2,600 students, and I have experience in uh, first and second grade multi-age classroom, third grade. I've worked as an instructional consultant and academic coach. And my, the bulk of my experience is in a second grade classroom. I um, will be working this year as a K-5 reading and math interventionist. I have been blessed in my district to um, have had many teacher leadership opportunities. And our district recognizes teacher leaders and um, capitalizes on that and hearing their voices and having them be an important part of decision making in Vicksburg, which I'm, I'm so, I so value. So in the district level, I've worked as a, a building on the building leadership team. I'm a district technology integration leader. So I work with teachers on seamlessly integrating technology into their curriculum, which is always exciting and different every day. I've worked as a district reading committee chair. And I work closely with the intern program from Western Michigan University as a mentor teacher, mentor coach, and a site coordinator for our interns there. Um, I'm, I also enjoy facilitating professional development in our district in the areas of um, differentiated instruction, balanced literacy, technology integration, and more. At the state level, this will be my second year as a proud member of the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council. And I've worked closely with, with revising and editing the K-2 literacy, um, er, K-2 early literacy and mathematics assessment as a committee member for bias and sensitivity, for um, item writing for item review for data review and the sort. So it's been it's been great to see that develop through the years. 
my um, areas of interest. I had some I had some trouble narrowing this down, and because there are many many things in education I'm passionate about, but I've, I've whittled it down to these the big three. The first being K three literacy instruction. So with this in mind, I'm passionate about using formative and summative assessment for data driven instruction and not using a one-size-fits-all approach to um, teaching our students to be proficient readers. Teaching the whole child is my second big area of interest. Um, we all know you can't throw seeds on infertile ground and expect something to grow. So as an educational system, we can't just focus on test scores, but on the whole child. We need to make sure that, uh, that our students receive everything they need in order to grow. Um, so some of my big areas of interest within this topic of teaching the whole child are meeting social learning needs, connecting with students, developing relationships with students and families, student motivation, student-led instruction, and um, certainly connecting home families with our school family. And finally, empowering teachers is a passion of mine. Within this, I'm, I'm eager to share ideas about developing teacher leaders, about providing support for new teachers and attracting and retaining high quality teachers to this grand profession of ours. So I am representing, obviously, the 86,000 teachers of Michigan, but more importantly, serving as an advocate for the million and a half public school students in this great state of ours is very important for me. I am proud and honored and humbled to be your Michigan Teacher of the Year. Thank you. Okay, so first let me say that after the whole presentation, there's a reception downstairs in Ottawa 2, if anyone would like to join us. Um, we have light refreshments. And then also, after we make the presentation, we'll get pictures back here. Um, and anybody, feel free just to stand up and take pictures. Don't go anywhere. And then after they sit down, we'll start the next one, just so there's not mass chaos. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let's start with Regional Teacher of the Year, Gina, Dr. Gina Pepin. I forgot to say I apologize. Um, the teacher, the educator is also is getting a plaque and then the school is getting a plaque um, to put up in their honor. Um, Regional Teacher of the Year from Region 2, Kimberly Regglesworth. Kimberly is a history teacher at Anaway High School, and Gina is a reading specialist and literacy coach at for the Escanaba Public Schools. Region three. Wendy Tenney is a music teacher at Lowell High School. <laughs> More exciting because Wendy is from the west side of the state. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Grand Rapids and Lowell are very close. I will be the uh, principal and the superintendent, financial officer. Chief Financial Officer and the Principal. So uh, I am introducing Wendy Tenney, and she is a music a teacher from the Lowell 
uh, area of school, and the her is a system, no, financial team. Financial team, uh, Nate Fowler. to the principal and the chief. The ones that are behind you. I didn't want, we didn't oh, want to give okay. you too much. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. No, well, we, we have them here, so I want to do it for this. Okay. <laughs> and then James Goodspeed, who teaches English and History at Fulton High School at Fulton Public Schools, is the Regional Four Teacher of the Year. It's very special to me. I have a lot of favorite subjects. Oh, maybe a different one. Regional Teacher of the Year in, in Region 5 is Karen Nickel. She's an elementary school teacher at Marlette Elementary School and Marlette Community Schools. And with her is Superintendent Sarah Barrett and Principal Jason Vislaski. I want to say thank you to <laughs> Region 6 Teacher of the Year is Robin Murray, who teaches English, Language, Arts, and History at Lansing Eastern High School in the Lansing Public School District. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Mark Coscarella and Principal Marcel Carruthers is here, are here. On behalf of the state board, I now thank the um, And uh, I had the privilege of being in a meeting some of you. all wonderful. And we have Mark, you have to get in there too. <laughs> Bobby Sue Adams, who teaches mathematics and physical science at Fowlerville Junior High School in Fowlerville Community Schools is the Regional 8 Teacher of the Year, and uh, Superintendent Wayne Rodell and Assistant Superintendent Tim Dowker are here. Superintendent uh, Rodell and uh, the Assistant Superintendent Joyner. 
Tom Tarento is our Regional 9 Teacher of the Year. Um, at the time that he was interviewed, um, he was the Director of Bands for Van Dyke Public Schools, um, and now he is at Grosse Point um, doing the same thing. Um, but today, Superintendent uh, Piper Bogner and Principal Billy, help me, thank you, um, are here with him. Regional 10 Teacher of the Year is Courtney Valentine. She teaches mathematics at the Detroit International Academy for Young Women in DPSCD. Uh, and also Principal Leader Rebecca Luna is here for her. I also want to thank Pam Harlan from the Mimic um, Education Foundation. They are a very um, proud sponsor, and we appreciate everything that they have done and will continue to do for this program over the um, very near future. She couldn't make it today. She sent me a text at 5.30 this morning saying that she had some business to take care of, but she apologizes. So I just want to give her a shout out and thank you to her very much. Oh, so, Sheila, Dr. Ziley, and... Sandra. And now we will have the uh, awards to our Teacher of the Year. And it would be both Cassandra and Richard. Laura Chang, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> mentioned you in, inspire people by um, by your example we teach by example as well as by our instruction and uh, we are honored by your presence here yeah, I say I really appreciate people with experience you have 18 years experience we began at age 10 so <laughs> <laughs> we identify talent that you are so sincere congratulations and we look forward to working with you And then we have 
Amy McCaw and Keevan O'Neill are here with Laura. Keevan is the brand new superintendent, and Amy is uh, Laura's elementary school principal. Thank you so much. That's it. Jennifer? Yes. Great job on your first time going through this. A Thank, you very, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And congratulations to all of our recipients today. It truly is the highlight of um, State Board of Education meetings to recognize the outstanding teachers that we have in the field of education. And I'd also like to thank um, the guests who are joining us today for this special recognition. Um, so we are very honored um, to be able to celebrate the successes of the amazing, outstanding teachers that we have here in Michigan as represented in the teachers who are in the room today. So thank you for being part of this very special event. And now I believe there is a reception, Jennifer? The reception? Yes. And, and pictures? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us will move on to agenda item six, committee of the whole meeting. First are our discussion items. The first, oh, sorry. Let him leave. Wait a minute. Let him give up two, three minutes. I thought. I told him that. Tom tried. I told him that. All right, agenda item six, committee of the whole meeting, first item, discussion, and that is um, a presentation on proposed standards for the preparation of teachers of lower elementary, pre-K through three, and upper elementary, grades three through six. Um, this is a presentation on the standards for the preparation of teachers in both lower and upper elementary education. Both of these standards were updated to support the top 10 and 10 strategic goal number three, which is to develop, support, and sustain a highly, a high quality, prepared, and collaborative education workforce, as well as the implementation of the revised certification structure. These standards will be placed on Michigan's current preparation, these standards will replace Michigan's current preparation standards for teacher of elementary education and will inform program development and continuous improvement efforts at Michigan's education preparation institutions. There will be a period of public comment followed by a request for board approval of the standards at its October 9, 2018 meeting. Today's presentation is an information item only and no action is required today. So I will turn the presentation over to Vanessa Kiesler, Sarah Kate Levan, Sean Kotke, and Kelly Cassidy. Thank you for joining us this morning. 
Thank you, Sheila, and thank you, board members. And I'm going to turn it right to the team to uh, take us through our uh, proposed standards for the preparation of teachers of lower elementary and upper elementary. Uh, good morning. Thank you. It's a, an honor and a privilege uh, and a bit of professional excitement to present to you these uh, proposed standards. Uh, as Sheila noted, this is in support of our goal three on the top 10 and 10 strategic plan to develop and support and sustain a high quality, collaborative, and well-prepared uh, education workforce. Uh, we have a large project here. This forms just a piece, uh, and this is our, our main talking point. Over the past three years, uh, Michigan stakeholders have developed a students first certification system uh, that prepares effective educators to use differentiated supports and meet the needs of the whole child. The purpose of these standards are three to promote effective early literacy instructional practices, uh, to establish a shared vision uh, for the knowledge and skills of entry teachers in PK3 and 3-6 levels uh, in Michigan, and to guide our educator preparation, uh, program development, and assessment. Note that this is part of a broader system of preparation and staffing. Uh, this is, these standards are not about current teachers in the field, but rather the primary purpose is to increase the capacity of our beginning teachers uh, for individuals seeking to add, uh, as well as people seeking to add uh, pre-K-3 or 3-6 endorsements to their certificate. It's the placement portion of this Venn diagram and is meant to establish a minimum standard of care for entrance into the profession. So why now? Uh, we have two issues at hand, currency and urgency. Uh, the current elementary teacher preparation standards were developed over the course of a decade, starting in 1997, uh, and what teachers are expected to know uh, about reading uh, and the teaching of reading uh, largely predates the National Reading Panel recommendations from 2000. Um, and provide very light coverage of the, the big five topics in the science of reading, uh, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Uh, the current standards have uh, parenthetical references to these uh, with uh, an awareness and knowledge, not exactly the instructional practices associated with them. Um, Michigan has also adopted uh, new standards and assessments for K-12 students beginning in 2010. So our standards need to be updated uh, in teacher preparation in order to prepare our teachers to teach to uh, and, and give, bring our students to success in those standards and assessments. This is a matter of some urgency. Uh, we note Michigan's early literacy initiatives. This grows out from that, but also which grows out from the uh, governor's third grade reading uh, work group which emphasized increasing the number of hours in preparation for the teaching of reading uh, to develop a pre-K-3 literacy endorsement uh, and to emphasize diagnostic-driven methods. There are also legislative allocations for upgrading teacher licensure tests. So we, we cannot upgrade those tests until we upgrade the standards on which those tests are based. So who participated in the update? Uh, we had 56 stakeholders who directly contributed, uh, and they represented multiple perspectives across the, the spectrum of our education community, from K-12 representatives to ISD representatives to representatives from our institutions of higher education and MDE cross office consultants. They were distributed across the state, too, so we got geographic balance. So brief look at the timeline, each of these items here shows where we, or when we started each of these initiatives. Uh, we started in literacy uh, in October 2016, um, but work was ongoing for each of these things as af after their kickoffs. So <coughs> mathematics started soon after in January, uh, and then our social studies and science then picked up in uh, December. That does not mean no work was done on science and social studies prior to that. In fact, the stakeholders working on the literacy standards and the mathematics standards looked into the science and social, existing science and social studies teacher preparation standards uh, for things that should be 
updated and that were important for cross-disciplinary instruction. Um, the foundational, or the professional portion of the standards, you can see the arrow going all the way across. Uh, we received lots of feedback throughout our uh, certification structure, uh, public feedback, as well as during this work in each of these different sections of the elementary preparations, the teacher preparation standards um, that were uh, germane to include in new standards. So a brief overview of uh, our standards. The, uh, you have uh, one set here that has PK3 and 3.6 in it, and each of them is divided into five sections. Uh, there's a literacy section, a mathematics, social studies, science, and then professional knowledge for teaching. Um, it maintains those sections that exist in our current teacher preparation standards for elementary education. Um, it does not have separate sections for arts uh, and physical education and movement, but rather those concepts are integrated into the content of the teacher preparation standards in these other content areas as appropriate. Uh, to emphasize, uh, emphasize cross-disciplinary instruction uh, at our earliest grade levels. Uh, several domains of the existing uh, standards for elementary education were integrated together into that professional section. And we'll give you more details on what's in that in just a moment. Um, and so that's just a quick, a quick overview. So, for each stakeholder group that was convened, they were posed with a, a simple question to begin, uh, or a simple series of questions. Should existing standards in each of these areas be affirmed without any changes? Uh, should we adopt another existing set of standards, whether it comes from a national organization, another state, uh, uh, earlier in Michigan standards history? Should we adapt existing standards informed by other standard sets that uh, exist out there? Or should we start from scratch and draft new standards? The literacy group, which was our first one, they opted to draft them. Uh, they took the hardest, the hardest road and hence had the longest uh, time on this. Um, they took, uh, there are two sets of standards in existence now that define what teachers uh, should know and be able to do in the area of literacy teaching. Um, and they, the goal was to combine that into a single set of standards that, around which an assessment could be built uh, to determine our teachers, uh, early grade band teachers' uh, capacity to teach literacy. Uh, they rejected the wording of the old, which as I noted before, had lots of lists of things. Here's some several topics you should know. And rewrote them, focusing on the essential, uh, the uh, early literacy task forces, uh, essential practices for teaching literacy. There's 10 core practices, which we've mentioned before in previous presentations on uh, MDE's literacy initiatives, um, with a mindset of what were the underlying skills and knowledge that a new teacher would need in order to enact those practices effectively uh, with our children. There, what developed from that are three overarching standards about literacy, on literacy learning environments, how a classroom should be constructed uh, to effectively promote literacy, culturally responsive practices in literacy, so how do you put students first in a diverse student body, uh, and then literacy curriculum design and assessment, what are diagnostic driven methods that are important regardless of the topic being taught. Each set of standards then develops and unpacks four, uh, 15 uh, core components of literacy. Um, and they're detailed, of course, in your packet. Uh, they do include the, 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 the big five uh, that I referred to earlier, as well as several other key concepts that underlie uh, literacy. And each of those concepts is unpacked with four things. What is it? So what does a teacher need to know about phonics, uh, what, what phonics is, uh, how does it develop in children? So what's the developmental trajectory we should see in children in the PK3 or in the 3-6 grade band? How do you assess it uh, for, so to determine that children are mastering this topic? And then how do you teach it? What are the best practices uh, that we would focus on to, to teach these areas? 
As I noted, there are 18 items, three of which are common to uh, all areas, and then 15 unpacked uh, literacy concepts. We now move to math. I'll talk to Kelly speak. The Mathematics Committee also decided to draft standards using resource documents that were available to them. They really struggled with trying to identify what knowledge was required for doing math and what knowledge was required for teaching math and how to make that show up in the standards, knowing that the standards we were starting from were, as Sean said, a list of topics. So thinking about what is it that <coughs> teachers need to know in order to teach those topics rather than just do them. So they really looked at how to fit those into a teacher preparation curriculum and considered about um, what is foundational to student understanding. What helps them build a conceptual understanding to do later math that is key to understanding math concepts. So they focused on the things that had a specific space in the K-12 curriculum. <coughs> they looked at the things that were fundamental to student learning or that teachers commonly struggle to understand themselves and it needs significant unpacking. And in doing that, they identified two basic areas. They have the mathematics-specific teaching practices, thinking about what mathematics instruction looks like in general. What does the classroom look like? What does it look like when you're doing small group and whole group? work in mathematics, and then they also focused on that mathematical knowledge for teaching, those conceptual understandings that teachers need to have. And in the PK3 section, they looked mostly at numbers and the attribution of numbers in geometry. So they looked at counting, and they looked at one-to-one -one correspondence, and they looked at those things that make up the basis of our number system <coughs> that students need to have a strong understanding in order to, when they get to the 3-6, do the numbers and operations and be able to manipulate those numbers and do multiplication and division and fractions and the more complex mathematics. So. Mm -hmm. Next we have social studies. The team that we convened to look at the elementary preparation, uh, teacher preparation standards in social studies for all elementary teachers, this is not specialized social studies teachers, opted to affirm uh, largely the existing uh, framework for the standards and the language with minimal changes. Um, uh, to note, the changes that they made in the language were to incorporate some research-based teaching practices uh, that the, the National Council for Social Studies promotes, um, and to update the language to defer, instead of having a list of topics, like they will know the following five eras in American history, to defer to the content of our K-12 standards. Uh, please note, this is not affected, the, 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 the value of these standards and the content of these standards is not affected by the ultimate decision by the State Board of Education on the newly proposed K-12 social studies standards. These are equally applicable to the current grade level content expectations. Uh, it preserves the same framework of topics as well as to the newly proposed PK-12 uh, standards. The key here and the reason that wanted to remove a list of topics from the teacher preparation standards is to ensure that higher education is cognizant of what is expected for K-12 students to learn in social studies uh, so that that content focus is deferred to what exists in the uh, state board adopted K-12 standards. The science stakeholder group chose to adapt. They looked at national research and frameworks and built their standards around those. Um, they too deferred the content within the science teaching standards to the K-12 standards. Um, they highlighted and focused on four main things. First is observing and explaining phenomenon. So things like that the moon appears to change shape over the month. Um, they wanted to build science teaching around what children see on a daily and monthly basis um, as a way to connect more closely with them. Um, they wanted to focus on science and engineering practices. So things like investigating, asking questions, um, having children ask their own questions and create their own investigations. Um, the third thing is cross-cutting concepts. So, um, Things that would fall under this category would be cause and effect, patterns, um, and really highlighting those in teaching and learning science. And then the fourth, th fourth thing is using students' experiences and interests to drive 
teaching and curriculum? Um, oh, a couple of years back, we adopted the next generation science uh, standards there. Um, and what's the re relationship between that and this work? So our teaching standards defer to the science standards that you all have adopted, so the K-12 science standards, and they're closely related. So is this an, uh, basically an adaptation of those standards to uh, specific grade levels, uh, or would that be a fair way to put it? So these standards actually use the standards you all adopted, the Michigan science standards, and created aspects around those. So it's essentially how to teach the K-12 standards is what is in these teaching standards. Okay, so they weren't really free to draft new standards or? The, the science work group was. They were, they, were, they were posed with the same question. Do you want to affirm what's in our current standards, our current teaching standards? Okay. Do you want to adopt new teaching standards that already exist, or do you want to modify um, or draft new, and what they chose was to take a look at um, the national research as well as the Michigan science standards that you all have adopted and pull together both of those sets of things and um, basically revise what we currently have for our teaching standards. So teacher preparation standards should always take into account the K-12 standards because if the teachers aren't prepared to teach the content, uh, the standards that K-12 students need to know, then we have a divergence. Teachers are prepared to teach this when kids need to know that. So I actually think that's one of the major, um, there's a lot of advancements in these standards, but one is that tighter alignment between the K-12 standards and the preparation standards. Okay. So the teachers know what K-12 students are expected to know and be able to do, and they know more about the pedagogical practices that support that content knowledge. Right. So in our previous sets of standards, there were lists of topics. <coughs> so it would say something like homeostasis. Well, what is that? Why is that important for teaching? And what does that have to do with teaching practices? Our new set of standards really lays out what practices should you embody or what kinds of things should a teacher do to carry out the K-12 students' um, standards. So for instance, focus on the phenomenon, so what children see every day as the basis for having discussions about those things and creating investigations and it truly aligns with the science standards that you all have adopted for K-12. Throughout the process and from our certification structure public comment, we saw a lot of things that transcended content areas that were specific to teaching children. So we focused on that within the professional by merging several sections of the former set of standards or our current standards which is the reflective practices, collaboration, and professional growth. And we incorporated <laughs> them all into this professional section along with some new ideas that really focus on three topics with the learner-centered supports, ethics and professional growth, and then strategic partnerships. So within the learner-centered supports section, you'll see information about how to teach to the whole child, how to address social-emotional needs, how to work within a system for supporting students, um, meeting the needs of English learners, working with students who have IEPs, and then general classroom management strategies. Under the ethics and professional growth, you'll see information about reflecting on the code of ethics. You'll see reflecting practices and making decisions based on how lessons went and whether they went well or not well, and really having teachers look back and thinking about what works and what doesn't as part of their growth. And then the strategic partnerships and how do we create relationships with families and within the school. Who are the specialists within the school to go to when you have a student who has needs that you're not quite sure how to meet? What is the role of the school psychologist? What is the role of a bilingual education teacher? And who are those people within a school setting to be able to identify those partnerships? So our next steps will be to actually extend public comment a little bit longer than what was mentioned at the beginning. Um, Knowing that it is the beginning of the school year and that a lot of people are busy getting their classrooms ready, we want to have public comment open and available through late September, which will be about September 26th. So we will have public comment open from what's release date at the eBlast all the way until September 26th. And then we will also be here to talk about the September um, 
board presentation, which goes kind of along with this and talks about the clinical preparation for what teachers are doing in student teaching and what they're doing in their experiences prior to student teaching and the practices that they learn in those settings. Those are more expansive practices that go across grade bands, which is why you didn't necessarily see them here today. Um, and then also coming back to the table with these following public comment at the November meeting so that we can make sure that we can have as open an opportunity for people to be able to respond to those as possible. And then after that, we would then provide technical assistance to programs in order to be able to update. And with that, uh, back to you, Sheila, for board questions. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentations today. And we'll now open it up to board comments or questions. I saw Eileen and Tom. Thank you. I know that this work is complicated, um, intricate, and challenging. Uh, I wanted to ask, I, um, recently I've, I've been involved with Teaching Works, which is mm -hmm. an effort by the University of Michigan to work with educating, uh, educator pro uh, professional education programs, TP, EPIs, across the state and nationally. And one of the things that was pointed out was that a number of ed schools don't have a way to see whether the practices they're teaching their candidates are effective in learning. I was um, surprised by that. It's a sort of a basic quality control that you have in the rest of the world. Just does your product work enough so that people need it and want it? Um, and I wondered whether the department has any, um, uh, in its supervisory role of teacher preparation, has any ability to uh, ask and require this uh, uh, educating, edu <laughs> I can't talk today, so <laughs> APIs, to uh, uh, document um, that practicality because um, uh, we're hitting them with new standards, we're, uh, new K-12 standards in a variety of areas, and now we're asking them to substantially change how they're preparing educators. What do you see in the field of interest in this, enthusiasm for it? I know that there was pushback on the original discussion about changing the standards for K-5, actually K-8, I think. Thank you, Eileen. So you asked two questions. You ask about accountability for educator prep institutions, and you ask about reaction of the educator prep institutions. Um, I'll, I'm going to talk about uh, the accountability briefly and then turn it to the team for anything else they want to say about that, as well as um, the reactions of the field. But um, so educator prep, uh, thanks for the lead off. The team has a well-developed educator preparation institution accountability system that includes looking at where candidates go afterward and how they do. Um, that's under some, we're look, taking a look at that again, making sure it's 10 and 10 aligned, but we, we have been doing that for five, six, <coughs> seven, a number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember how many. So um, there is that quality control measure, and they also go through their accreditation visits where there's kind of a deeper dive into um, student products, outcomes, that sort of thing. So that is separate from the standards. I mean, it, it relates in the sense that how, um, what we want them to be doing to prepare their graduates relates to their outcomes, but the educator prep accountability is uh, we'll we'll alter, like we'll um, adjust it to take into account the new standards if if they're passed. So it's kind of like any accountability system; it follows from the expectations. So let me just ask, d dive down a little bit deeper. What I'm actually asking is if there's any method to have them show that when they um, uh, a student teach, for example, in in an institution, that the methods that they're using are uh, effective for kids. And I, I hear you that you're tracking where, where new teachers go and you're getting feedback, but that's not the same as being able to say to the program, um, gee, uh, you're working on this, you've just taught these students for two years and uh, their student teaching isn't matching what the, um, the state standards are for educator preparation. We don't have a mechanism for that and I'm wondering if we should. We do have two other things. Um, we use their educator evaluation labels and track them back to their institutions. So all beginning teachers within the first three years get tracked back to the institution in which they are. So we take a look through our EPI score at those labels and monitor institutions based on that. And then Sean has a little bit more information. We do have mandatory accreditation requirements in Michigan for EPIs. And part of that is tracking data back to the institution about their candidates and completers. I'm not being critical. Um, I'm just yeah. saying you're talking about a reactive <coughs> assessment that could take two to five years for feedback, <coughs> yeah. in which time they've produced more teachers who may not be matching the classroom. 
And I don't know what we can do anyway um, uh, to nudge them to say, we know this is hard for your mm -hmm. educators, your professors to change their practices, but without that, schools aren't going to be able to teach children well. Well, we have, so as, as Sarah was mentioning with our, our accreditation, uh, one of the standards is program impact, uh, uh, candidate and completer impact on student learning. And pr the programs have to produce data showing that their candidates make an, a positive impact on student learning, in student, in, in student teaching as well as in their, um, their initial placements as, as employed teachers. Um, and that is a challenge for many of the institutions. Uh, we have a huge cohort of institutions going through their national accreditation in 2019. Um, so we'll be able to get more, be able to see more of the data that they're producing. Um, but the second piece, and this previews a little bit of what we'll be talking about here in September, is we are partnering with Teaching Works on the, uh, the high leverage practices and, the, and adopting those as core sort of core practices that, that all teachers should be able to demonstrate. And as part of that work, they are developing with their Michigan Program Network, which is right now six institutions uh, around the state, a series of assessments to be deployed in student teaching placements um, that measure candidates' uh, behaviors and, and impact and, and enactment of effective practices. And our goal is to use that partnership to disseminate those assessments out, work on making sure we have valid and reliable assessors uh, in the field um, so that we have more um, smoothness to the, the, the picture of teacher competencies emerging from our teacher preparation institutions. That's reassuring. Thank yeah. you. We're excited by that. Thank you. Tom? Um, looking on page six, um, L2, B, and C, it says that the well-prepared beginning teachers of literacy will select instructional materials that value and reflect the multidimensionality of diversity represented in society and children. And I don't know what that means. Uh, could you, I mean, I guess uh, under each of these, um, like an L2, B, C, D, and ev all of them, all of them included in this document, is there something behind each one of these one sentence statements that actually expand on what they're talking about, or is it up to the college to decide what they want to, how they want to interpret that and how they want their teachers to understand it, or? Uh, excellent question. Uh, thank you. First, let me unpack multidimensionality. Um, when we talk about diversity, we want, and we've, we've been trying to promote this with teacher education uh, for quite a while now, we don't want diversity to be seen as a single dimension, skin color and race. Um, but rather, we have other kind, we have other diversities, uh, socioeconomic diversity being most impactful in our schools, language uh, diversity, ability uh, diversity, and a child could be situated in any any constellation of um, of, of diversity. Right? They, there, there's is there any, any limit to diversity? I mean, you know. Uh, a bully could be diverse. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, is there anything that you don't oh. want to value? Or are we, is there anything, any context, anything that we're saying, this is how far it is and we're not talking about these things? So again, let's talk about the purpose of these standards. They're to talk about what our teachers, what a well-prepared beginning teacher will know how to do. And we want a well-prepared -pre beginning teacher to know how to understand the multidimensionality of diversity in their classroom and reflect that in their teaching practices. These standards won't make judgments on how much diversity is too much diversity. That's not what, or what... Well, it says value. I mean, when I see the word that value... Value and reflect value that there is lots of different types of perspectives okay. and diversity in the classroom. I mean, I think the question of what kind of diversity might not you value is not something these standards will weigh in on. And okay. I think that's an interesting philosophical question. Yeah, I, I would hope they but, wouldn't. Yeah. Right. It, but it's to say that as the teacher, the more you... And going back to Laura Chang talked about the whole child, you know, the more you understand all of the uh, students in your classroom, the perspectives, and the perspectives not in the classroom, the better you are as a teacher to help situate the learning in a way that helps the students really engage in the world around them. So maybe those that will be implementing this understand that. That's what I'm wondering. Is there anything behind, like, for example, L2B? I mean, is there something that that supplements it and says this is what we're talking yes, about? Yes, we have a glossary. we're not talking about? Yeah, we're, we're building a glossary for all those key terms uh, that will accompany. Is that and something that we're also kind of approving then? Because, I mean, if, 
to define what we're talking about seems to be pretty important and what we're not talking about. Um, as Kelly said, you know, the way we've thought about implementing the standards it once if they're approved is through technical assistance and that guidance to working with the institutions. That's where like a glossary technical assistance would come in. So we, um, we aren't, the glossary is not included in the standards at this point. Um, okay, I mean, I guess I would see that the glossary could be something that uh, could be debatable. I mean, there could be things that this is what we meant. Well, I didn't think that's what you meant. And, you know, there, so I'm a little curious about that. Moving on, and I don't have too many, but I do have a couple. Uh, C, right below it, <laughs> critically analyze texts with children for social and cultural biases by analyzing language and visual representations in print, digital texts and media that perpetuate gender, social class, and racial ethnic stereotypes. And I, I get that you would not want instruction to be full of stereotypes, but this goes further and is going to analyze text with the children and start talking about, look, this is a bias that's bad. Maybe this is a bias that's good. Maybe this is a bias. I mean, is there judgment in this sentence saying, again, we bias against certain things that are, we view as not good, and we, you know, and there's certainly stereotypes that are bad and, and uh, biases. So, again, this seems, I, I want to make sure, I don't, I don't quite understand what this is getting at because it seems like there's value judgments involved here, certainly ones that are very appropriate, but I didn't know. Again, are there guidelines to these stereotypes and biases, or, or are we just saying instruction? I, again, I can understand instruction shouldn't have biases, stereotypes. I understand that. But this is getting further in instructing the kids. Be critical thinkers and to be able to understand how texts convey social and cultural biases, which any text, in your point, could have a social, social or cultural bias. And being a good, again, a good citizen of the world and a good critical thinker would suggest that children know how to recognize that and engage with it and make judgments about it on their own. Okay, so this, so what well, would you, do you does, have a, does this say that they, the teacher won't in, help the kids make those judgments? Or they won't be instructing in those judgments? Or is that something underlying, you know, the guidebook or whatever? That will say this is not what we're not talking about. This is what we are talking about. Struggling a little to understand the exact nature of your concern. That I can you say it again? Maybe well, I'm, just I understand that you're going to let them recognize biases. That's important, you know. And there's bi I recognize biases all the time. We could say Fox News has a bias, and and you know MSNBC has a bias. So to, to recognize those, but then to, is it going further and saying these are bad biases and these are good biases and these are bad stereotypes and these are good right. are they so going to they're taking the children right. through them so critically analyzed you know means think about those things so this is a book about a fairy princess and it portrays women as pretty and helpless and also empowered and in control what does that tell us about gender and what do you you know that it's like an analysis and teaching kids to ask important questions okay. about text that's fine i just are, is it, could it be construed as something different? Uh, you know, is there going to be, is it, do you think it speaks for itself or I guess the guide, okay. That was just another. And then one final was on phonics. I'm, uh, I know there's a large number of people and I happen to be one of them that thinks phonics, we've gotten away from it pretty substantially and it's a, one of the problems with uh, why kids can't read very well. It, was there a phonics expert that evaluated these standards? And if so, who, what, what was the name of that person? Uh, multiple uh, phonics I, experts. Um, can I get the names of those? Uh, should we send them to you? I can give you, yeah. we've got a list on the, of people on the back we can identify. I'd, I'd like to know specifically who looked at these and said these are, these are good instructional methods uh, to instill in teachers regarding phonics uh, teaching. So I'd like to get those names and yeah. understand well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two right now. Uh, our main researcher, uh, Nell Duke, uh, is an expert in all of the early literacy space, not just not just within phonics, but knows what the research uh, tells us about effective phonics instruction. Um, and Mary Lowe's uh, from you know, Oakland University was one of our uh, outside readers uh, who evaluated and focused very much on this section. But they are not focused. Okay, you say they are experts in phonics t instruction, mm -hmm. yeah, among other topics. Yeah, but they, yes, they are. Okay. And then this doesn't talk about time, uh, you know, amount of time, be, you know, involved with phonics and phonetical awareness, and does it? I mean, we're, is that up to 
Time in the to, classroom or time, time in, the in the classroom? So these are not K-12 standards. They're standards for right. teacher okay. preparation. Right, okay, time in the instruction of the teachers. It is up to the program to cover efficient or effectively and efficiently all of these standards. Or to be able to, okay, be able to, because um, I mean the, the, the other one we looked at had talking about they need to be able to take children through this and that. They need to be able to um, really get, okay, I mean it's not a superficial understanding of phonics. They need, is there something that says they need a deep understanding of phonics? If I can just interject, uh, Tom, we had an, uh, a presentation by MAISA on the GELN standards, the essential literacy practices, and this is hooked with that. So those are really specific and exist, and the department has paper copies besides online. That's where you'd want to look for what they're basing it on because it is, um, it's all uh, methods of instruction and literacy, including phonics. Uh, they're, just, they're just reflecting that. And we had it just, I mean, your surgery was in April? March. Mar March. I think it was at the, I'm not even sure at that meeting. But it's, it was it's in March because it was March's reading month that we did that presentation. Uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, the link is in here, and I think that will give you the answers for your next set of questions. I can also add our standards uh, in literacy, prep, our teacher preparation standards in literacy have never had this level of detail about phonics um, and the expectations. Uh, as I noted earlier, they had had simply, they will know uh, what is and how to teach phonics, period. And, then, and that was as much detail as, as it had. This tells us, it unpacks what phonics is uh, how phonics should develop across the, 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 life, the lifespan, the development span uh, of a child in these grade levels, um, how you effectively assess it and how you teach it. Um, and the order in which these uh, topics occur, particularly in the PK3, is indicative of the foundational importance of each of these things. So uh, phonological awareness typically precedes phonics. Uh, you know, an awareness of the sounds of the language before you then make the sound print match. Um, and having it early in the set of topics uh, is, to, is intended to give us that emphasis that this is uh, foundational. Okay, I have down Michelle, Richard, Eileen, uh, did you? That, that was uh, really okay. all I wanted to inject. And then Cassandra and Nikki. Okay. Um, so, so my concern, uh, you know, with the um, retention bill and hitting and all that, and that some districts are much more, um, uh, are going to be much more impacted. So when, you know, I know you talk about differentiated instruction for the students. I'm wondering if there's any sort of differentiation for the uh, prep programs because they feed into certain districts. And so uh, my concern also is in Detroit where in other urban areas or areas where it's really difficult to get teachers <laughs> um, to, uh, and they might be reluctant to go into a district that is troubled because they'll be, you know, negatively evaluated and all that kind of stuff. So are the, is, there, is there any consideration um, when you look at different prep programs who they're preparing um, in, if they're going into a district that's going to have, um, you know, a, a high proportion of kids in the PK-12 that are going to be at a greater deficit than maybe wealthier communities. Or, um, so it, I, I'm just wondering if that has been considered and um, woven in. And also, to Eileen's point, when there is an assessment, um, uh, so many people are leaving within the first couple of years. And... Um, to be unfairly assessed because they're working in an environment where there's more challenges. So, um, so are, are there considerations um, that differentiate where they are and the challenges they're dealing with um, in, in, in this model? Um, no, uh, there aren't um, at face value because every candidate must meet these standards. Every program must meet these standards. Every candidate must pass the licensure exam that will go with, or exams in this case, that will go with the set of standards. 
Um, what we do have, though, and you'll see this next month, is the two companion things that will come forward, which is heightened clinical experiences. And those have to be met in certain areas. So you want to refer to the diagram. Oh, OK, yeah. So overlaying this set of standards are two other things. One are the clinical experience requirements. And those are extremely heightened and have um, an increase in other aspects that you'll see, such as diversity aspects and other, um, I'll call them competencies for a lack of another term. Um, and then the other piece is the foundational experiences. And those actually can get modified for the region in which the institution is sitting and the expectations of the school districts in which they're working. And then, oh, sorry, sorry one more thing is we do have expectations that arise from accreditation that all of our institutions partner with their local school districts. And it's through that partnership where they have increased expectations and their candidates would meet um, extra things for the region or the district that they're working with. And I'll add one thing from our team's perspective. They support all of our educator prep institutions, but in a, in a commitment to continuous improvement, they do different types of supports with different institutions based on the needs that come out of things like accreditation or the accountability score. So they would know that X institution <clears throat> was struggling with onboarding the literacy standards and would provide additional technical assistance to get them to quality. So that's just part of our internal work about how we help institutions. And then we do, um, what we, part of that work is we do work with institutions in specific regions. So um, Wayne State has an urban focus set of programs where they're working with, say, Detroit or others where we have talked with them about other supports that they provide for the district and how they're tailoring their programs and how the partnership between the two is coming back and helping them continuously improve their programs. Um, so there are regions where we're working with the institutions to do that. So, so a candidate who's in the teacher prep program who is planning to go and be an urban educator might have, will, will learn the standards the same as someone else. But, is, but there's, so I'm just wondering if there's any extra, and it sounds like there's extra supports, but it's up to the institution to provide it with their partnering districts. Is that? Yeah, and the requirement is for the partnering districts to inform the preparation program as well. And so it's through that link that there are extra supports and extra resources and extra things for those candidates. So is, does the, the department have any role in overseeing that? And then when there's an assessment, or you're saying you get this data, I'm assuming that's test scores, back, is there a consideration um, given um, about the unique challenges of a particular district and, um, and, and ensuring um, that the institution itself is not um, penalized in a negative way. Yeah. So there's a couple assessment pieces in here. I just want to lay them out so that we're clear what we're talking about. One is every candidate in Michigan has to take a, a, the Michigan teacher test for certification. So I, I think Sean used the word assessment about this. There are, we need to be able to assess every teacher on do you know, this. know these yeah. standards. Yeah. So that's the teacher test. Um, we just worked with the legislature to have the test for basic skills removed. So that um, hopefully will help us with a barrier that was we think was restricting the pipeline for some candidates who were qualified to learn to be a teacher, and so it should. So that's positive, especially for some of our areas that um, we want to recruit more more people into the profession. So that's teacher assessment. Students in um, schools take, as you know, assessments in grades three through eight and eleven, and then according to the Michigan Educator Evaluation Law, uh, starting this year, actually. Um, the results of those growth from those assessments is required to be used in teacher evaluation in a way that's determined locally by the districts. Those evaluation labels roll back to the institution for new teachers. Um, that's a part of how we look at how the institution performs. It's not the whole piece. It's actually a relatively small piece. And I think, well, it's, it's small, but it, the point on triangulating data and that how your evaluation plays out might be related to how you are. But Teacher evaluations as well triangulate data. So it's not all growth data. It's also observational data and other pieces of practice. So in, if the system's working well, 
Lots of different types of data are used at the teacher level, which then rolls back to the institution level where we also use lots of types of data to think about institution progress. The accreditation, when Sean was talking about data there, that's a whole slew of um, placement data and surveys and satisfaction and you know, there's, it's a lot of, some of it might be related to assessments, but it's more about where did they go and how did they do, and how did they do much broader than how their kids did on assessments? How did they do as teachers in professional practice communities? So I know that's a long answer, but trying to get at, um, are institutions penalized for preparing teachers to go into our neediest areas? Right. I would say no. no. Actually, they're supported to do that. So we've been supporting um, types of programs and helping them develop types of programs for specific needs. So um, MSU, for example, had a program um, for people transitioning into teaching who were from math and science, and they had masters in math and science degrees, but they were specifically going for urban teaching and hoping to go into Detroit. So that's a type of, of program that instead of penalizing them, that we would try and figure out how to work with and build, mm -hmm. and then help them get their people to place in Detroit. And, uh, Concordia University has developed a partnership with East Detroit Public Schools for right. growing their own teachers. And so that's very tailored to a specific mm -hmm. environment. Um, and they're, they have the obligation to, to demonstrate that the teachers have you know, they master the, the things that they need to master, um, but also that they have a, we sort of hold them harmless from um, maybe other elements of, of, of program review, but because that's going to be very tailored to the needs of East Detroit Public Schools, <coughs> or East Point, sorry. Uh, yeah, East Point. Yeah, and I, I, I hear that. I, I just, I, I think that the, well, the problem is to me the teacher evaluation systems are quite biased, both on the observational level and on the t testing level, and they're not valid measures. So my, and I, so I, I'm just hoping that um, that it doesn't uh, negatively impact the teacher prep system. And I, I'm, it's reassuring to hear that there's other things that are considered. Um, but I, I, I really, especially when teachers are in their first years, when they're they're just getting their sea legs, you know, they're not going to be at their prime until they've gotten at least five years under their belt. I think most of them. So um, I just think it's something that should constantly be considered and um, especially given the great need for teachers in these areas and they're not coming into those areas. They're not, we're not getting them. They're begging for jobs in Detroit. Um, and I think they don't go in because negatively evaluated and unfairly on these systems that we're using. So, so thank you for listening to my concerns. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, moving on to Richard. Um, I think, I think there are uh, two thoughts uh, that um, arise from, from uh, some of Tom's questions. One, I think the importance of defining things like diversity, because if we don't define it in the standards, then it, it leaves the judgment to whoever the superior is. And then you've got no, no ground of appeal except for the superiors, uh, the administrators, supervisors, whoever you want to call it. Um, and and that, that leaves it to subjective judgment. And, and in areas of diversity and, and what constitutes diversity and its, and its relative value, uh, there's, uh, you know, um, that's not an accepted, there, there are differing of opinions. Um, and, uh, and they tend to be political opinions. So I, I think that we need to be careful um, in, in trying to make these things clear. And the other issue, I think that uh, maybe, you know, when you talk about bias, we, we all, every speaker has perspective. But when we call it a bias, we're inviting people to dismiss it. And I think it's that aspect that, that troubles me. Uh, it's one thing to acknowledge a, a writer's or a speaker's perspective, what things they say, what things they experience. But then to characterize it as bias invites us to dismiss it and not consider it. So it, it's actually an anti, it can be an anti-intellectual uh, uh, thing. Uh, so maybe there's another way to, to maybe clarify, are we really asking kids to identify perspectives and evaluate them? That's a little different than identifying biases. Okay. Um, 
All right. And then the other area of uh, just, uh, I'd invite members of the team to just talk about, you know, in, in some eras we were very concerned about, um, uh, especially early elementary, developmental uh, concerns. Uh, Piaget's idea about the child's developing intellect uh, reminded me a little bit of, of the development of a butterfly. You know, butterfly, what's good for a caterpillar is not necessarily good for a butterfly. And, and therefore, the instruction in math that you have in kids before they reach the period of, of symbolic thought is not necessarily going to, you know, upping your scores in fourth grade math is not going to lead directly into higher scores in, in high school math. So. I'm just curious, uh, I'm, I'm sure developmental ideas are implicit, but I don't see them explicit in what's been presented here. And I would, I would think that would be crucial for early elementary teachers. For the mathematics, the team focused, I say mathematics, that was the one you had pointed out, so I'll start there. Yeah. Um, the team had focused specifically on those things that the PK3 students need to know, and really around the number and attributions of number and geometry, and what are the things that are truly basic to understanding things later, knowing that they won't have those symbolic things. So how can we do things with objects? How can we do things with pictures to really focus on what number means and how to develop correspondence and how to develop those early skills. And then the 3-6 teacher focused much more on the fractions and the operations and how to build off what the PK-3 standards focused on. So the trajectory actually goes across the two sets of standards in by changing what the areas or focus are. Um, and we, one of the kind of hearkening back to our presentation a couple months ago, one of the reasons that we've adjusted our certification structure is to recognize that the way that you need to teach PK-3 students is different than 3-6, is different than middle school, is different than high school, and that we need our teachers to be adequately prepared to teach differently development in developmentally appropriate ways, pedagogy and content, in order to um, develop that student across the whole educational lifespan, I guess, to use Sean's word. And I just, just as a reminder, um, and I think it's, it's a little hard, the, uh, the presentation has so much information in it. Um, just in terms of process, um, how we even got to these, the team was really, ta the team did not write these. The team brought together these groups of experts across all the areas, and they were also charged with scanning research, practice, and laws and requirements, and coming up with standards that would move us um, appropriately as suggested by the latest research, expertise, as well as which would meet the needs of um, laws like our, the, the Read by Grade 3 law. Um, so. So when you're seeing, I, th I think just the point is when you see them all down on a page, it's kind of hard to remember the, for me sometimes it's hard to remember the, if you uh, excavated below them, the archaeology of where each of these came from, that there was um, three years of work by people who are deep experts in the field digging into and having tough discussions about this piece of research versus this piece of research versus this practice versus this belief and weighing out and getting to consensus to bring a fairly I mean, they're long, but they're pretty darn short compared to what they represent. So um, just kind of just knowing that there were lots of perspectives and debates about these pieces and that it's a little hard to represent just in the standards. You don't necessarily see all of that process. And, and your concern on, on developmental appropriateness, and it was the guiding vision behind why in the literacy there is this how it develops section for each of these components to ensure that teachers are cognizant of the developmental sequence of each of these skills, and then being able to tailor instruction to what that child needs. Uh, so if a child has mastered phonics, they don't need to spend more time on phonics, they need to move to the next level. Mm -hmm. Same with science. Science wanted to start with what children observe on a daily and monthly basis or cyclically, and that's where they chose to focus their standards on, because they know children start by observing the world. That Richard, thank you very much. Uh, Cassandra, <clears throat> uh, very briefly. So you had fifty-six stakeholders, and then you um, separated into different committees. Correct. We had separate committees, and then we also had um, review teams. So after the committees would build things, and review teams would take a look at them, having not heard the conversations, and provide feedback that would then go back to the committees and revise based on some of that. So we had mini public comment throughout the process. 
So we're current teachers on every committee? Yes. Okay. Um, and then one briefly, and you may have mentioned this, and I apologize if you did, but um, can you talk about the, the conversations about the social study standards? It's the one area where they affirmed, and it's also the one area that we currently have, uh, we're updating standards. So um, how did those two kind of go together? Uh, I'm happy to address that. Uh, what they were affirming was the framework and uh, the, the core instructional practices that are embedded in the current uh, social studies teacher preparation or teacher preparation standards for social studies for all elementary teachers. So they reviewed it and said, yeah, these the practices that were in the 2008 standards are pretty good. These are up to date. What was not necessarily uh, up to date were some of the specific language about topics that, that they would need to know. And they said, you know, it's better to say that to defer knowledge of the topics to what's in the K-12 standards so that a teacher doesn't come out, say, uh, prepared to teach all about the Civil War and very little else, and the standards don't put much emphasis on the Civil War, uh, as, as one example. Um, the, to, to have the preparation program be mindful of what's expected uh, for, for K-12. Um, they made a few tiny updates to the instructional practice language to reflect the, the, the C3 framework from the, the National Social Studies uh, Organization. So uh, they knew that the K-12 standards were a moving target, um, at, that they were moving forward, but they said the core uh, distribution of, of sub-disciplines is consistent between uh, the existing K-12 standards and the emerging uh, K-12 standards, and so they preserved that within, uh, within the sets. Okay. Thank you. And then Nikki. Um, just in the interest of improving literacy and how these standards would do that, there are other topics I just I think that can be discussed later, but so currently, like you said, there's like one sentence on phonics. Hey, teach phonics. But there's no specifics via the accreditation body or what every university does or how much time that university spends on phonics, if you will. And then I heard you say that that's also going to continue to be the case where you've taken one sentence and maybe made three or four or whatever, but you're not suggesting how much time to spend on that particular topic. So I guess my question overall, just from an implementation perspective, in, in order to really have impact, instead of just saying a few more sentences versus just one, what holds the MDE back from, I mean, you have an accredit, accrediting body, you have universities, you're making statements on what to teach and how to teach. When literacy is such a serious problem, what holds you back from saying, and as a matter of fact, we suggest you spend this much time on it? Just, I mean, just, I did, I'm curious overall. I mean, I, the team might have a different answer, but I think we, uh, as the State Department, we try to stay away from, in a lot of senses, uh, you know, the seat time idea of spend three hours and then you learned a lot about phonics. Well, you might have spent three hours doing nothing, you know. So we don't necessarily get into prescribed times, but I think the, the, the proportion of the standards reflected by the topic suggest its importance in the preparation. So in our technicals, also the other thing is institutions might have innovative ways to approach the teaching of phonics. So while one institution might be like, I'm just going to sit them in a classroom and show them PowerPoints, another might do a combination of clinical placement and field experience and uh, blended learning and find that to be a more effective way to have their, their students learn. So how do you count that time? So that's why we don't get into hours or days or credit hours. Also, every institution has their own version of credit hours and semesters and whatever. But we do want to, to your point, though, escalate the importance of literacy instruction and these standards, not just phonics, but do that about literacy. So I think it's a good point about how do we make sure they're making time for the important things without prescribing this many credit hours or this many pieces. Do you guys have anything to add? Yeah, I'll add one, and then Sarah has another. Um, there's a, a constitutional limitation to what we can prescribe um, for our, our colleges and universities. Um, but one thing we do have leverage over is the teacher licensure assessment. Mm -hmm. And so right now, for the, element, the elementary teacher assessment uh, is one test. Um, it's 
compensatory, which means you could do well on certain portions of it and not do well on others. Uh, and it covers eight different sub areas. Um, and so you could, for example, um, be great, know your, know your stuff in math, know your social studies and science and the arts and health and PE and world languages and not really know much about literacy and still pass the test and become licensed. The licensure test that, we are put, that we're building in this has a non-compensatory section on literacy, also a non-compensatory section on mathematics. So each of those sections uh, is about the size of the current, in, in the framework we have, is about the size of the current elementary assessment for all the topics, grades K-8. So we will have a, a richer assessment, and you, you, you cannot pass go uh, to the classroom unless you pass that, that assessment. And so the, the space that we can devote in the assessment to individual topics in here, like phonics, uh, is, is much richer uh, than in the current assessment system. Using a lever other than required time to ensure that teachers have these skills. I'm actually going to you covered what I think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering, I mean, what would it be like if, if we didn't ensure that nurses knew how to give blood or um, assess breathing and airway? You know, I just, I feel like that's where we're at with literacy. Uh, I'm sorry, Nikki, could you speak a little louder? I'm just talking about the importance of making sure our teachers have the skills that they need to, to teach literacy. Actually, I'd love to have you repeat your analogy so the whole board gets it. Here's it. I was suggesting that if teachers can pass their test without being able to teach literacy, it's sort of equivalent to a nurse not knowing how to give blood or assess airway, breathing, or circulation. So that's how it is now, but the test that we're building, they can't, non-compensatory. So if you can't pass the literacy part, then you can't be a teacher. Like, right. if you can't draw blood, you can't be a nurse. <laughs> On that, because it is that foundational skill so necessary for all of our educators. And the assessment that we're looking to build is very different than the one we currently have in terms of the types of questions. So an example is um, we are looking to build one where we have sample student work. And the candidate or the individual taking the test has to take a look, figure out what is actually going on, what is the student doing, or in the case of, say, mathematics, where is the misconception? And then what next practice would you enact? And then the test would go on from there. So it's less just straight multiple choice, more practice based. Also, it would be based on these. So the current mm -hmm. one is based on current standards, which tends to be a list of topics. Can you do these problems? Do you know this thing about reading? The new one will be much more about what instructional moves you make and what teaching things do you do around these contents. So it'll be less about can you do this math problem, and more about can you teach this math concept. Mm -hmm. Eileen? Well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this question, but um, going back to the concept of struggling to get teachers in the classroom, um, I'm still not completely sold that our current assessment system for K-11 is going to match up with our state standards. I know we're trying to recruit kids in high school to go into uh, teaching, and I'm very concerned that we ambush them at the end with something that aligns to all of our patterns, but we haven't done a good job of helping them get to, it's a chicken and the egg problem. So uh, how, when is this assessment given? It's given at the, I, I'm presuming it's at the end. Um, we've, we've talked before about how we make sure the candidates for teaching have the basic skills knowledge coming in that's really going to be required. So, I, and I'm sure, knowing the sophistication that you're putting into this system, that that concern is being discussed and hopefully addressed. But how do we make it so that um, kids who may not be well prepared for ed school, uh, are our kids coming out of our current K-12 system going to be ready for this sort of um, intensity in, in uh, uh, K-6, K-5, uh, in these new standards? Or are ed schools going to be doing um, a fair amount of remediation or colleges? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's probably a little of both. Um, so remediation in, in many cases, um, as well as what, what happens after this is we change the preparation programs completely. So colleges and universities will be expected to completely overhaul their preparation programs. 
And so in doing that, they build in supports and they build in things for actual teaching and learning how to teach. And so again, what you'll see in September, and sorry, this is piecemeal, is um, the clinical and core components. And it's the overlay of all of these things that will help support the candidates get to the place by the end of their program where they need to be to come out as well started beginning teachers. Um, and I think the other piece is, um, and it doesn't quite address what you're saying, but I think in the past when we, we gave our standards to all for adoption, we were behind the times. In this mm -hmm. case, we have worked with GELN so closely that it's our standards are not so far behind anymore. So as the field is getting the GELN literacy standards and math standard, you know, practices rather, our standards are coming out right beside them. And so what our cur current candidates are seeing in the field will be those things. Which is fabulous, and I'm really excited about that because that means that for the first time we'll have cohesion. Exactly. Um, I, so, uh, and I also just now remembered that I'm hearing of ed schools holding camps for prospective applicants um, for kids, I'm thinking it's in a senior summer or it might be earlier than that to help them brush up on they these are, things. That's what's going yeah. on. Yeah, there are a is, lot of supports that are being built in. Okay. So we, we are... Um, we are behind the wave trying to get surf, surfing on the wave for preparing more teachers who are qualified. It, I totally believe in what you're doing because we can't, unless we, it's, it's, it's absolutely incomprehensible to me that we would ambush a young teacher who's gone through, paid tuition, and done his or her best in college with a classroom that doesn't match their ability to teach. I can't imagine that. And I, we're doing it all the time, I know. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that that part will work, but then I'm really concerned that we prepare our candidates before they go to ed school for what they're going to face because K-12 probably has not done that at the moment with these changeovers and the fact that we see state, state tests. Yeah. yeah, we'll keep that in mind as we yeah. continue to build. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. okay. Any, other, any other comments or questions from board members? All right, I'd like to thank our MDE team for their presentation today and also for engaging with the Board of Education on a very robust conversation this morning on the proposed teacher preparation thank standard. So thank you. The next item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is a presentation on partnership district model update. This presentation this morning provides an update of the onboarding process of round three partnership districts and an update on the Benton Harbor area schools. Um, this is an information item only today. Um, there will be no action required. Um, this is Luana Shelton's first board meeting since being named the interim assistant director of the Office of Partnership Districts. Welcome, Luana. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so we're just going to go right into a very short presentation. Um, summertime is uh, not a lot of activity going on. And um, we did reach out to a couple of districts about coming to presenting. But again, over the summer, it's a little difficult. So we do want to get back into that uh, throughout the year to bring in districts for you guys to um, interact with. The round three and the last round for the next three years we signed, we onboarded and signed 19 partnership district agreements. You can see who they are. So I'll just give you a moment to scan that. May I just make a request? Uh, in the future, if it's not, op if the community where the school is located isn't in the title, if you could just uh, put, put that as an add-on. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, and then going to the, the second slide, or the third slide, it's just giving you a uh, comprehensive <clears throat> look at what we have done to this point. So round one, if you remember, we signed nine districts. We have eight districts with current agreements. 
because of Benton Harbor, which uh, Kyle will talk about. Round two and round three, even though they were they were signed at different times and identified at different times, we still they their schedule is the same. So there were seven districts on round two and uh, nineteen districts this last round. You see that their start time and end time are exactly the same. So our round one began in June 2017 and will end in June 2020. All the rest remaining will begin this September and end in 2021. Well, as you are aware, um, Benton Harbor um, inter, uh, um, entered into a cooperative agreement um, with us um, as an extension, uh, a revision of their partnership agreement. Um, uh, Dr. Bob Herrera was identified uh, as the CEO to head uh, this agreement uh, with the district. He started a little under four weeks ago. Um, his focus has been, in his limited time there, has been on staffing and personnel, the finances of the district, and leveraging new partnerships to support learning and instruction. Um, uh, I've been down there with our treasury partners uh, twice in the last uh, three weeks to meet with him and board members and other, others in the community to get a handle on uh, the focus and help um, both he and the board start to uh, transition to their new roles on the, and what their roles and responsibilities are under the um, cooperative agreement because they look uh, different uh, in both instances. Um, uh, they had their first uh, board meeting and advisory, community advisory board meeting uh, this past Tuesday, uh, which gave Dr. Rare the first time to address not only board members, but um, also community members on his progress and the work, his work uh, in the district uh, since he started, um, again, about four weeks ago. Okay, and then our last slide is just to remind you that with round one that signed a year ago, their 18-month goal time will be January 2019. So there'll be much more to come on that in your monthly updates as we get closer and how that's how we're going to approach that and roll, and roll it out and report back to you how they are doing. That's it. Okay. Before I open it up to questions or comments from board members, I'd like to welcome Kyle. Um, Garant to the table. Kyle Garant is our interim um, SRO. Um, so we're glad to have you joining us, Kyle, and we appreciate you accepting the interim position. Yes. So uh, just a, kind of big picture, uh, does the dis does the does MDE feel there's any districts that are not on track, you know, that are um, Concerns that um, we're going to read about in the paper in a year from now that uh, things didn't work out and we got to close them or you know there's some other something else is going to you know is there any any trajectory that is disturbing at all? Well, obviously Benton Harbor has moved into another level of of accountability, mm -hmm. so that was one of our key concerns. Um, all of the other ones, you know, I think the, the work with partnership districts, we know that the work is challenging, that they're dealing with challenging situations, so there's course corrections and, you know, no one else is in a Benton Harbor type of situation, I guess is a good way to put it. We also, you know, outside of the big markers, I wouldn't want to say publicly so-and-so looks terrible right now because we're mm -hmm. <laughs> a little preemptive on that. <laughs> So we are tracking data. We are doing, you know, where we watch things like, are you drawing down your grant funds? Are you getting your programming in place? Are you staffed up? There are bumps and highs and lows, and some are doing, you know, and again, the work is challenging. So people will be cruising along, and then they'll hit a bump, and we kind of try to help them. So no one is at the point where we're at with Benton Harbor is probably the best way to say it. So, but as we approach the 18 month, we need to be ready to have tough conversations where appropriate. Um, first off, uh, what proportion of Michigan students, we've got about a million and a half, what proportion of them are in partnership districts? That's a really good question. Well, let's see here. So 50, is that an, 50,000 in Detroit, and then... <laughs> is that an answer that we could put we can, into the board? Can, yeah, yeah, I was trying to think if I could get, get, get an answer, but you can put that before. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, and my other thought is... Um, uh, 
we some districts are in trouble because of finances others are in trouble because of academic achievement presumably all these are the partnership districts are for academic achievement uh, do those two sets of problems tend to go hand in hand how how much correlation is there between uh, financial financial trouble and and academic trouble are there any uh, examples of the one without the other, or are they very common? I'm just curious. So you're absolutely right that there are districts in academic distress, there's districts in financial distress, and there's a pretty big bend between the two of those. Um, the partnership districts are not all in financial distress, but most of them are. Most of them were deficit districts or were in other forms. There are a set of deficit districts who are not partnership districts. So like I said, there's a bend on either side. It's about 70%. But about a seventy percent overlap. Okay. Our, our okay. programming with the partnership districts focuses on all of it: finance, academics, non-academics, staffing, the whole, the whole work. And actually, a lot of the work that we do with deficit districts through the financial independence team also merges academics and finance, even if you're not a partnership district. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Pam? I, you know, I, I will just have to say that I was at a meeting, I can't even remember how long ago it was, that I um, went into, and one of the questions that was being asked, and I've, it was the Saginaw School District, so they're on the 18 month, um, they're coming up on their 18 months, and so their question was, you know, how can MDE assure them that, that, that we're stabilized enough to make sure that we have the appropriate personnel that's going to remain there and stay there and stay the course because we've been building up um, while they're uh, coming online, those districts that are the 18 months, meaning we had uh, Dietrich and then they were waiting for that's Dietrich, he came, he left, um, and then, so that was the question that I heard them ask their liaison. Um, how do we know that you're going to stay the course with us? So that was one, you know, that was one of the questions that I heard ask. Um, I still hear about making sure that there's transparency, um, meaning that the community doesn't always uh, hear back. I, and I know that some <coughs> districts are better at partnership than other districts. So some districts may understand how to partner with their community and making sure that their community are on board. Some districts are understand the necessity and the power of partnership better than, than other districts. And so how do we make sure that the community is aware of how um, expansive or how, how they can, how uh, the schools could really be using them as partners? Um, and when I talk about partners, I mean everything from parents to community members to, you know, a business. But how do we make sure that we're, how are we making sure that we're doing that? Um, some other questions that, that I've had is, you know, what, what is the difference between going into these districts, um, learning, knowing what we know, and how quickly are we able to shift and make sure that we're providing these districts uh, with, with what is needed? Um, so I guess I will, I'll stop there right now with, with my questions. Um, I have a few others. Um, let me just add one more is is how are they how are you helping them to truly assess uh, the problems as well as develop the solutions how is how how is that being done I know with Saginaw with the liaison that they have now they were really uh, happy with the fact that they have issues with their curriculum and helping them to be begin to evaluate that problem this is something that I talked to Brian about um, some time ago but that they were able to help those educators in the, in the school district, uh, because there's been a lot of tension there around curriculum, but be able to evaluate that problem um, in determining what the needs are. And so they were really happy about that. But I know that some of that takes some stretching um, of districts, but um, how are we helping to support those uh, liaisons uh, in doing that as well? So taking your questions from the top, um, you said it very well, Pam, that we've been building out the office as we've been doing the work with the first nine. So there have been personnel shifts. One of the big reasons for both Kyle and Luana's 
interim appointments is to provide some stability through a time of transition and make sure we can keep providing good programming to the districts. What hasn't shifted is their goals, their agreement, um, supports from the MDE, you know, the, the feedback. So while the personnel move around a little bit, and that is important, we want that not to be the case, the, the big picture hasn't moved. So um, we're going to keep working on stabilizing personnel. Um, we also, you know, had a liaison, have his wife get a job someplace else, and I guess he wanted to go with her. I don't know. I thought he should have been here. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed like it was important. So, um, so it is a thing, and Saginaw got hit by it probably more than any other district. Yeah. So it is, that's unfortunate. Um, the transparency and the community yeah. partnership, you're absolutely right. There's just differentiation in how the partnership districts are doing partnership. And so luana has been starting to work with the liaisons and thinking about, um, when they're not, how do we have a resource packet? How do we push them more? How do we help bring more people to the table? I think if I'm being diagnostic, it's a place where MDE has underpowered what we've done to help the partnership districts there, and it's an area of focus for, for me for the next year that we be more intentional around, okay, um, Muskegon Heights, you seem to have all these partners at the table, but X other district, you have one partner. That's probably not enough partners. Or what's your communication plan out to all your partners? So, um, and then, Helping them assess problems and develop solutions. Again, we have done things. We are formalizing those and trying to make sure that when we say, here are some good ideas to solve your problems that you've diagnosed through this needs assessment, that those are things that we really support as a department and are aligned with our overall department perspective on, on whatever the topic is. So for example, the MDE does not prescribe curriculum and we don't want to prescribe per curriculum. But we know that our partnership districts need help in understanding how to evaluate the curriculum you have. If your curriculum is not up to snuff, what can you do? What are the resources? Who can help you? So focusing on that part and getting better about, um, yeah, knowing. And we really know that we need to be able to support um, partnership districts around curriculum around staffing, um, when the Educator Excellence Office was up here before, we talked to you guys at the table about things we've done there, around finances, mm -hmm. that's kind of under the work we've talked about. Um, and probably something, um, the, the, the supports, the attendance, the whole child supports more, you know, they're trying things, but what else can they do? So we're, uh, Luana was just working on a one pager today to help that be more clear to our partnership districts about if you have this problem, here are some things you can start with, and how do we empower, um, get the liaisons trained better to be able to help partnership districts navigate that. Did you guys want to add anything? Um, only that, I think in one of your questions you asked about, you know, uh, assessing a need and, and getting, uh, getting help to them. The 21H funds, I mean, that's part of that process. Uh, I think we had a, a district elect to use 21H funds to do a curriculum audit, which is a great use of the funds because by doing that, they were able to really reflect on what was missing, the gaps, what was needed, and this audit, of course, is agnostic in the sense that they're not promoting any kind of curriculum but saying this is where the gaps are. Um, so I think um, it, it's more about liaisons and the office just continuing to connect with all of the opportunities that are available inside of MDE and outside of MDE and constantly connecting the districts with them. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, team, for your presentation on update on round three of partnership district agreements. And with that, I believe we will recess for lunch and uh, reconvene at 1.30.